do you think we should uh, consider for late MRI-based thrombolysis? So actually, based on, on the results of our trial, mm -hmm. um, it's, it's all patients that present to us with any um, the neurological deficit, yeah. independent from the time window, so yeah. with unknown time, sim uh, time of symptom onset, yeah. that should be considered for reperfusion yeah. treatment, and that we should study by MRI to, to see if they are eligible and might benefit from the, the treatment thrombolysis. But as I recall, the inclusion criteria uh, we included patients with an NIH of six and upwards. What, what about those who have a little bit less deficit? Do you, do you think we should consider those? I know this is a bit premature, but mm -hmm. that's what the clinicians will ask themselves because a hemiparesis, but not adding up to, to five or six. What do you think? Or is it too early to discuss? Well, I fully agree, and yeah. actually this is what we did. We did not have a lower NHSS threshold in the trial. We, we defined it as a relevant neurological deficit, okay. and this is uh, usually, of course, it's a higher NHSS, but even a small, a low NHSS score may represent a, a relevant deficit, so there was no formal, uh, lower threshold. Yeah. So basically, we consider all patients who come in late. Well, and with the maybe, relevant maybe to, to add on this, um, we didn't mean late. Basically, yeah. we just we have those twenty percent patients. We don't know mm. at what time the symptoms started, and so some of them are probably lay, but have good collateralization and have a good pattern on MRI. But others, they may also be early because they just woke up and then they were admitted to the hospital. So, and then we also see a favorable pattern on MRI. So it's not about this late or not late. It's just about having MRI yeah. instead of a verbal information on the time window. But you know, often it's it's like when when we when we see patients, the neurologists want to know if it's relevant to go and see this or that yes. patient. You know, um, I would like you to describe uh, what are exactly the MRI findings that we should go by. So, in in uh, the approach used in our trial. Yeah. We looked at two different MRI sequences, mm -hmm. the diffusion-weighted imaging, mm -hmm. which shows you with a high contrast the uh, acute ischemic lesion already within minutes. Mm -hmm. And then we take a look at the flare, also a very standard mm -hmm. uh, routine uh, yeah. sequence, where the ischemic changes become obvious only after some hours. Mm -hmm. And if there's a mismatch between a visible um, ischemic lesion on diffusion-weighted imaging, yeah. but no marked hyperintensity on flare, then we can assume that the stroke uh, has occurred just recently and yeah. the patient is likely to benefit from thrombolysis. Okay. Um, further, I would like to know, but when looking at the, the, the benefit from this trial, I was comparing it to, to the results from, from earlier trials, looking at the NINS 1 and 2 and looking at the history. And, and looking at the ox rating, of course, that is a bit crude and you can't do it, but, <coughs> but anyway, everybody do it. Um, the benefit's quite high. Is actually pretty much as high as, as within the three hour window. How do you explain that? Do you think it's because of the tissue based selection or is it simply because we, we, we which I think is correct too, care much better for patients than we did in the early 90s? Yeah, I mean, we cannot really prove because yeah. that was not the scope of the study. But um, of course, what is very plausible is we also require that there is a definite ischemic lesion. Yeah on DWI. Yes. So we don't apply thrombolysis to stroke mimics. No, and we know true. from larger cohorts that those are a couple of percent, or maybe three percent, maybe five percent sometimes. No. Those ones will probably not really benefit from thrombolysis, obviously. No. So that is already an enhancement no. of the no. cohort. No. And um, also, I think it is more precise. We, we know that the collateralization is very different in different no. individuals. And there are some that after two or three hours they probably already have um, irreversible uh, tissue damage. Mm -hmm. And those ones we would also not have treated in the trial because we would have seen a flare, a large flare lesion. So I think this is very likely, although we cannot prove it, that this yeah. enhances the cohort with people that benefit. What about the patients with uh, DWI negative strokes? I know these are, some believe in them, some don't. I think I see them because they later on have a flare lesion, so then I believe those will will not be part of this treatment. 
Well, for, for the trial, of course, formally yeah. we excluded them because mm -hmm. we required uh, a visible DWI lesion to, yeah. to demonstrate and prove that it's an ischemic stroke. But for the clinical practice, I think um, it's about transferring trial results yeah. uh, to, to a routine practice. And mm -hmm. of course, if we see a perfusion lesion that uh, identifies stroke with a negative DWI, I would personally consider such a patient for treatment anyway. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Um, also thinking of the clinical practice, how many patients do you think we, th this will actually end up being? Because r right now in, in stroke units where we're looking at the, 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 the patients who come in late for, for endovascular treatment, so, so it looks very much like that the numbers are increasing. How do you think you will contribute to that? <laughs> So what we can say, just uh, uh, we know about the, the estimated number of mm. patients with unknown time of symptom onset, and it's yeah. roughly about 20% of all stroke patients. Yes. So we may expect that the, 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 the number of patients mm. that qualifies for thrombolysis might increase by this 20%. Uh, and you think they're going to, yeah. And I mean, there's no reason to believe that in, in patients with unknown time of symptom onset, mm. the distribution between large vessel occlusion and, and others is different from the, from the regular That's distribution. Yeah. So there will also be those 10, 15% maybe max that, that have uh, proximal MCA occlusion or carotid artery occlusion, and they are eligible for thrombolysis, mm -hmm. uh, for, for a thrombectomy, yeah. and, and the others, what do we do with them? So obviously now we have an option. So I think it's substantial. Yes, and I, I think in clinical practice it's easier just to take them in and not have you know a lower threshold on, on severity to, 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 to look at patients, but no, for, for organizational reasons, which is probably very important. The trial seems to have run very smoothly, smoothly, at least as I have observed it from, from, from the side. Um, but what have you done to, to make it run so smoothly? Well, of course, we're happy to hear that it looked like this from the outside. <laughs> Actually, it was a, it's a tremendous and hard work, and, yeah. and uh, it was a great team effort, of course. Yeah. Not, not only uh, the two of us and the, the core team yeah. in Hamburg, mm -hmm. we had a, a European consortium of, of uh, yes. uh, partners, which were the core of the trial team, and we had investigators in 70 trial sites in eight mm -hmm. European countries, and they all did a uh, tremendous work yeah. just to, to get this trial going. And I, what I always felt is that everybody involved in the trial understood the need for this trial. It's yes. such a simple question, yeah, yeah. And, and that's I think that helped us uh, to get the people motivated to really uh, put their efforts in the trial. Yeah. And in a, a sense, I think it also paid off that it was, it was, it was a pragmatic trial. Yes. That uh, starts with the eyeballing of the, the of the, the lesions and MRI yeah. and the two sequences, mm -hmm. and it goes ahead with a very simple and clear strategy how to use it and how to apply Altiplast and 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 people like that yes. in general. Yeah. So, um, but the major point is the people; they were just great. Now we're about to to, to wrap up. What do you think is the most important uh, thing in this trial? What 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 is really the take home message? I think what's important is that this, this trial is the first positive trial of intravenous thrombolysis in patients with unknown time of symptom onset. Yes. So it's a paradigm change because it, it's the first intravenous TPA trial that does not rely on reported time of symptom onset mm -hmm. but uses advanced imaging yeah. to select patients. And it opens up a treatment mm -hmm. uh, a window uh, for effective treatment for a large new group of patients yeah. that currently have been excluded from treatment. And what do you think is the most important take home message? I think the Difficult most important thing for me is really it adds up to our spectrum of possibilities that we have for our patients. So yeah. it adds up to the new thrombectomy um, options to Dawn to Diffuse 3 and now we have something for actually the majority of those patients where we don't know the symptom onset and it proves the concept that it's worth doing some advanced imaging yeah. and, and um, how many different forms of advanced imaging we will have in five years, I don't know, if we have yeah. more even better. Yes. And basically, this is the first trial that actually proves that this is useful, right. which is also very nice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.